Another uh, question that was sent in, this was sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Zach. Ayo, Jim and Brian. Ayo. And by the way, the topic of this email is younger fan who is curious about Michael Hayes and the Freebirds. Ayo. Ayo. One, one group and particularly Ayo. <laughs> one individual that has my wrestling interest surging recently is learning about the Freebirds and Michael Purely Sexy Hayes. From the high points of how fitting coming out to Bad Street USA, well, well, it was fitting they wrote the fucking song. The movements of Michael Hayes and his overall look and promo, and obviously the Von Erich rivalry, and then you have the not-so-high things like the apparent ego of Michael Hayes wanting to keep the Freebirds looking strong, which resulted in things like Dr. Death traumatizing Michael, Terry, and Jimmy from hearing the phrase, fuck with me. It's worded uh, somewhat odd here. <laughs> My question is, can you put into perspective the Freebirds to someone who didn't grow up in that territory era? And if I might also ask, what kind of reputation did Michael Hayes have? And do you have any particularly interesting stories about him? Oh, God. D so, I, mean, to just... I think this is a great question, though, for a younger fan. Let's say someone yeah. born after 1990. Let's say someone born after 2000. You hear about the Freebirds. You see that Michael Hayes is a clown now. What did they really mean when they first popped up? Well, fortunately, I'll be the Forrest Gump in this scenario. I was there at the start. Not at the start of their team, but the first time that they were advertised and billed as the Fabulous Freebirds, the first time they used the Freebird Skinner song to do their entrance, because they had, a lot of people know, Terry and Michael met in Mississippi when they both had gotten into the wrestling business as teenagers and were working for the, you know, when the, the Curtis family, the Culkins, George and Gil Culkin that wrestled as the Curtis family in Mississippi were on the outs with Bill Watts and weren't part of Mid-South Wrestling. They ran their own territory. It was a small time deal, but they would give guys breaks. And Michael had, was from the Pensacola area. He had grown up with, um, Paul Bearer, Percy Pringle, and the Gibson brothers, and especially Robert Gibson, and, you know, an old-time guy named Mike Hendrick that didn't go very far. But uh, anyway, Terry was from Chattanooga, which was more of the ghoulish territory, and Terry had started working outlaw shows when he was 14. You see him against Ernie Ladd on those 1976 IWA tapings. Terry, I saw Terry the first time. He was 16 years old. He was 6'4", 250 pounds. And he was the same age as me. And I'm like, what the fuck? Um, but anyway, they met and they teamed up. And finally, they both quit the Mississippi Territory and got booked in Nashville for Nick Goulas. But Nick wouldn't use the Freebirds because Nick had never heard of Leonard Skinner. And this was 1978, by the way, or 79 by that point. Um, he'd never heard of Leonard Skinner. He didn't want to play any rock and roll music. He's the one that asked if his booker, Tom Renesto, said, are them Freebirds, them boys taking them marijuana pills? So they were Terry Gordy and pretty boy Terry Gordy. And uh, I think Michael Hayes at one point when he was like 18 was Lord Michael Hayes. And then, and then was it, uh, whatever the fuck. Anyway, they finally, they got booked across on the other end of the state for Jerry Jarrett and to the Memphis territory and finally got to become the Freebirds because Jarrett was a little younger and understood what was going on and they'd already dabbled in using music. So they bring them in and now they're the fabulous Freebirds. They're wearing the robes. They're using the fucking Freebird song. And it kind of didn't fit because they're wearing silver robes and furry robes, but they're playing Skinner, who was, you know, shit-kicking fucking Southern Rock. And so finally, they, they get to go to Louisiana, where they get a, a chance to go to Watts's military school for wrestling and start to understand things. And Terry's still only 19 years old. He's the best big man in the ring in the business. He's just a natural. And Michael could talk. Terry couldn't at the start. He got a pretty good promo later on, but Michael could always talk. One thing Michael couldn't do was work that well. 
<clears throat> nobody really wanted to work with Michael because I, I can tell you he, he punched me one time on top of the head on in his comeback so hard that my teeth clacked together and my front tooth broke out at the gum line and I spit it out in my hand from one punch not even in my face so Watts saw that Michael was a personality and that's when he added Buddy Roberts to the team because Buddy Roberts was a veteran he was a great worker. He could be the guy to drop the fall because you didn't want to beat the mouthpiece and you didn't want to beat the giant. And so Buddy became the utility guy and Buddy also was able to ride in the car with these guys. They drank his... Buddy drank and did everything that the Freebirds did, but he was 15 years older, so he was able to teach them about the wrestling business and survive on the road trips. And that's when they started being more instead of being the the long robes and pretty boy Michael Hayes or pretty boy Terry Gordy or, you know, the long hair, whatever, they started getting more Skinner dish. They started bringing out the fucking Confederate flag, the stars and bars. They started wearing the jeans and the fucking T-shirts and the Freebird shit and then Bad Street USA. <clears throat> and they're, no, they're not wearing silver lame fucking furry robes anymore. And that was really the Freebirds, and they drew money. They drew money in Mid-South, which is, you know, it, it's not hard to do even when you're young and inexperienced because you had Watts booking you, and you had Watts teaching you and putting the shit together. But they drew record money. They ended up, the Freebirds were the biggest drawing tag team in the history of Mid-South wrestling until the Midnight Express came, and they're still in the number two spot. And Michael's match with JYD because they're the ones that got to blind the dog. So they drew incredible money and repeat money and repeat business in that territory. And JYD and, and Michael Hayes in the Superdome outdrew the Midnight Express in the Last Stampede. That was the only show that was ever bigger in the Superdome than the Last Stampede. And they had r incredible heat. So when all of the promoters hear that there's these 20 year old guys in louisiana putting almost 30,000 people in the superdome and doing this business well naturally everybody's interested and it was a it was a no brainer that the freebirds could go from louisiana to georgia championship wrestling and what was that 1981 by that point 80 it, at the end of 80 yeah toward the end of 80 because now TBS is in a lot of homes and Georgia Championship Wrestling on TBS is the biggest rated show on cable. And the Freebirds, because of Michael Hayes' promos and Gordy's just craziness and just the whole gimmick and the fact that they were always in an angle with somebody somewhere, whether it was Gordy giving DiBiase four pile drivers and him stretching him out of the studio <clears throat> or them te teasing the hair cream again, or, you know, just Michael Hayes' promos on TBS with Gordon Soley. That first one. That first one, the oh. first time where the music hits. Yeah. And they're just standing there with Gordon. It was unlike anything you had ever seen on Georgia TV. And that's the thing is, I mean, that's when I started driving 20-something miles to Weasel Dooley's house just to watch the TV show because the Freebirds were on it. This was the first... As, as, as MTV wasn't even on the air yet. Music videos were starting to be made and shown on other programs, but this was the first rock and roll tag team before the Rock and Roll Express. The fabulous Freebirds, but they were heels. They got over as heels, but they were cool, and they fit the fucking picture. Nobody had played the rock and roll music, but the, the rock and roll before. Nobody had played it on wrestling. There wasn't a three-man team before nobody was doing promos like that gordy was exceptional and then from georgia then they they really could have had a bigger run like the midnight express did for seven years straight but they got screwy with their booking and remember when they turned Hayes on gordy and they were separate for a while and gordy was teaming with snooka and Hayes was a baby face teaming with kevin von eric yeah, and then Hayes went to Continental for a while, and Southeastern I'm not gonna, still, but yeah. It was Southeastern, but I'm not going to say anything, but back then when a guy of that left a spot like on Georgia TV to go to Southeastern in the Pensacola Territory, Piper did that once. It was, 
it was generally because there was a disciplinary situation or it was an easier territory to get away with doing the other things you wanted to do outside the ring. Or they love cocaine. Well, that kind of is what I just said, but I wasn't going to blatantly. But anyway, but they were apart for a little while and then they, then it was a monumental angle that, that covered both. They were appearing in a diff- number of different territories. They were back and forth between Dallas and Georgia and Hayes between Georgia and Southeastern. Then they put the birds back together and went to Dallas full time and had the run with the free birds or had the run with the Von Erichs, which was just incredible. And again, you've got guys in their early 20s selling out Reunion Arena in Dallas, Texas, going to the fucking Texas Stadium, going to the Cotton Bowl, whatever. They got the the chance to go to the WWF uh, because Dave Wolf, Cindy Lauper's manager slash significant other, was a huge not only wrestling fan but saw. I mean, here's because Michael Hayes really thought he was going to be a real rock star at that point. I think. I mean, you know, his singing sounds like you disemboweling a cat, but with the TV and the gimmick and the personality and the way wrestling was going, but they couldn't. They couldn't exist as people in the WWF, the fabulous Freebirds. Not just Michael, but fucking Terry. Not even Terry, just Buddy. Any of them. As as people, they they could not. That would be like taking a rock and roll band and making them go to work in an at an office in a suit and tie at an insurance company. Within a couple of weeks, something's going to fucking happen, and it didn't take a couple of weeks. And then they left the WWF. And, you know, but I, I just don't know how to, unless you were there concurrently at the time, they were an incredible tag team in the ring. They, they had the guy and Gordy picked it up later that could fucking talk and get the shit across. They were different. They were young. The people, the, the, the younger people like the, every redneck in the South wanted to be Ronnie Van Zant, every including Michael Hayes. And then they tapped into, they were one of the first heel teams that while they still had tremendous heat, and they're the ones that when they'd go to Lake Charles, Louisiana, they'd have to go to the police station and have the police take them to the building because the fans were cutting their tires. So the fans started cutting the tires of the police car that brought the free birds to the Civic Center. And they would they would try to shoot the Drano and the water guns at them because the cops had them surrounded. They had tremendous heat, but for and with the Cajuns didn't like them, and the women didn't like them, and the fucking older people didn't like them. But the young white rednecks that wanted to be Ronnie Van Zant, they all wanted to be the fucking Freebirds. And you would it, you would go then it started being a thing where, especially with the matches with the Von Erichs, you'd go in those buildings in Texas. And there would be on one side of the ring, there'd be Texas flags flav- flaving, waving, flags waving from the fans. And on the other side, they'd have the Confederate flag for the Freebirds. Because the the girls loved the Von Erics, and all of the girls who wanted to fuck the Von Erics, their boyfriends were pissed at the Von Erics, right? It, 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 Do you remember what got- Kevin said? This isn't a feud between Texas and Georgia. This is a feud between decency and filth. Yes. And and there you go. And that's the way a lot of people saw it. And some people were on the decency side and some people were on the filth side. And they, <laughs> but it, it just it just it, it to you can't understate their impact. And whether it's the Freebirds three man rule, the Freebird rule is a three man team. They started doing it immediately. Pretty much right afterwards, Dennis Condry, Randy Rose, Norvell Austin started doing it as the Midnight Express in Alabama, but the Freebirds were the first. And that was because of Watts's forethought and foresight to replace. Michael wasn't the manager, and Michael still wrestled in some of the matches. Michael definitely wrestled in the six mans, but Gordy and Roberts were the team that he wanted to use in the ring for the quality of the matches, and also because, as I said, you could beat Roberts. And not take any heat off these guys. And he took great bumps still at that time. And yeah, and he was tremendous at that point. Because he was only, I don't know if he was 40 yet at that point. He'd just been around forever. Within a few he was, years, he looked 50. Well, that's because he was around fucking Michael and Terry on the road. <laughs> I've told you. 
Bobby Eaton and Georgia rode with him sometimes. And one time that cop pulled him over and it's Bobby Eaton and all three free birds. And they opened the fucking driver's door to talk to the cop because the window wouldn't roll down and, and the fucking beer cans come spilling out of the floorboard, just dozens of them. And the, the entire inside panel of the, the driver's door just falls off into the fucking road and the cop just looked and knew who they were and just said y'all just get the fuck out of my county right just go just leave um but anyway it was it, they were a huge team and they were the, they were not only for once they were the darlings of the budding smart fan community at that point there weren't a lot of us but we were there they were the darlings of that community while still being big draws in, in reg to the regular wrestling fans and you know and and uh, that's why i'm i'm still amazed michael mellowed in his old age and and also i mean he's still been in trouble and on various occasions and they sent him to rehab i guess they had him taking that medicine that makes you violently ill if you drink alcohol at one time as a condition of him staying employed up there but just the fact that if you had asked anybody in the wrestling business this is not due to talent or not due to the ability to promo or not due to wrestling mind, but just can Michael Hayes stay employed with Vince McMahon for 25 years? Why people would have blown snot in your face laughing. And so that's, you know, what has shocked and amazed me, but it just that he's only had the, the number of close calls he's had. But that was the point is you could tell the free birds were almost except for the fact about wanting to blind the junkyard dog or whatever, the free birds that you saw on television were the free birds that you got at the convenience store. That was the free birds. There was no exaggeration of personality. Michael Hayes wanted to be the uh, rock star, Ronnie Van Zant. Terry Gordy was a wild ass fucking country boy that didn't know his own strength and would kill you playing with you. And Buddy Roberts was the veteran that liked to party and do all kinds of shit and was the only one that could fucking withstand traveling with them. There was a story that one night they were in Reunion Arena in Dallas, sold out one of the Star Wars shows, 18,000 people. The Freebirds hit the ring in street clothes to jump the Von Erics and get some heat on them. Buddy drops down to his ass in the middle of the ring to pull his, because they wore real cowboy boots. He's pulling his real cowboy boot off to fucking beat one of the Von Erics over the head with it. An ounce of weed fell out of the boot in the middle of the fucking ring. And enough to where the people popped on it. Oh, the Freebirds, he lost his weed. And he grabbed it, stuck it in his pocket, and started hitting the fucking Von Erich over the head with the cowboy boot. They were real. You didn't have to make up a fucking gimmick. That's, and, and they produced in the ring, primarily because of Terry and Buddy, and they produced on the microphone, primarily because of Michael. And there wasn't no bullshit about their gimmick. So that's why they got over and were remembered for so long. I remember talking to you in the 90s when I was a teenager about what the Freebirds are like when they first started when you were a teenager. And I really wanted to see everything because I hadn't yet at that point. And I said, what do you have? Can you send me anything? And you said, oh, I have everything, but I don't have time. And you <laughs> hooked me up with Ken Cantrell. Because That's he was right. another free bird nut from the early days, and he had everything off Georgia TV. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. Um, the, they, it was like now, I guess, watching Heyman and Reigns on SmackDown, although not really as bad. Georgia TV was okay then, but you didn't get main event matches, but you had the stars, you had you know the DiBiases and all the guys that could work their ass off, but the free birds were the highlight of those programs. You had main event personalities, and again, at that time when the free birds first got there, Free birds versus what Sullivan and Austin Idol. That's great stuff. Yeah. And the four flat tire. I didn't say anything about four flat tires. I've redone that angle. I did it in OVW. I did it in Smoky Mountain. I think we might've done it in ring of honor, but the fucking big match was going to take place where the free birds were finally going to have to get in the ring with Austin Idol. And there's no Austin Idol and he don't show up and he don't show up. And finally, what did they do? They put somebody else in, or was it Kevin by himself? What did they do? Help me, oh, savant. Oh, it's been a while since I watched it. I want to say it was Kevin by himself, but now I'm not sure. But nevertheless, suddenly Austin Idol bursts into the fucking, when the heels are about to kill the poor baby face, 
Austin Idol bursts in in his street clothes. With, I, think he, I think he had the Halliburton suitcase, whatever. He said he gets in there. He makes a big comeback in the ring. And he says that, you know, the reason he was there is his, he had to change. It takes a while to change a flat tire. Right? Well, then later on, was it later in the show? Was it the next week? Came, whatever. I think it may have been later on. And it's it was important. later on. Yeah, it was later on and- in the program. The, the free birds are out there pissed, and he comes out. Because Michael Hayes said, well, what were you going to say first? It's important to note he had just been one of the top heels there. So he had just turned babyface. So you kind of didn't trust him still. When, so when yeah. he's not there, it could be the heel Austin Idol up to his old tricks. Yes. Did he leave Kevin twisting in the wind? Right. Or but, but, but whatever. But anyway, Hayes comes out and does the promo where he says, yeah, he comes in here with some kind of, didn't say bullshit, some cock and bull story about having four flat tires. Well, that's a bunch of garbage, blah, blah, blah. And then Idol immediately comes out. Wait a minute. What did you just say? I said, you made up a story. No. What else did you say? I never said anything about having four flat tires. And boom, how would Hayes know? He stooged himself. And here we go. And they have the big fight again. That when people were trading out on fucking videotape around the country, it was fucking great. So I'm that's at the time Georgia Championship Wrestling, as I mentioned, was not only the highest rated, not wrestling program, it was the highest rated program on cable in those days, uh, because primarily the early, any time that a city or an area got cable in the late seventies, early eighties. I'm not joking with everybody. There was other motivations to get cable, but every wrestling fan in the world got cable specifically to watch Georgia Championship Wrestling in those early days when it was hard to get and you, you had to wait. And that was a big fucking thing to do. Is So that show was good and you saw a lot of the stars, but the Freebirds stood out. You have to imagine if... Back then in 1984, let's say, the fans had access to Raycon earbuds. They would have been listening to Bad Street USA everywhere they went. No, they wouldn't have because Bad Street hadn't been recorded yet. They would have been listening to the dulcet tones of Ronnie Van Zant singing Whoa. Freebird while they... It was recorded in 84. Oh, in 84, okay. I, yeah. thought you were, I thought you were going back in the Georgia Championship Wrestling days. Nevertheless, you can listen to Freebird. You can listen to... Michael Hayes disembowel cats. You can listen to anything. You can listen to us. You can listen to anything you want to listen to on the Raycon earbuds. And there's new ones out. Have you heard about this? Have you read about this? The new everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. They've got an improved rubber oil look. You know what a rubber oil look like is, don't you? It's the rubber oil look that looks like oil on rubber. It's very shiny. And it's nice and it's smooth and it feels good when you stick it in your ear or whatever you put oil on that's rubber, whatever you stick it in, any orifice. It feels better with the oil on it than if you go in dry. But folks, the optimized gel tips have a perfect in-ear fit for those of you who like oral sex, A-U-R-A-L. Do it in the ear, folks. Anyway, they got three new sound profiles to make sure that everything you're listening to sounds its best with just the right amount of bass. There's the pure mode for podcast listening, blues, instrumental. There's the balanced mode for podcasts and rock and heavy metal. There's the bass mode for hip-hop and EDM, whatever that may be. And Reggie, if you want to listen to Reggie music, put it on the bass mode. They've got these different switches, so it always sounds just right on the bass. And after you finish with the bass, then you can adjust the trout and the bluegill and even the crappie. Folks, there's also an all-new awareness mode for when you need to listen to your surroundings. You just hit the deal, and you can hear what's going on around you, which is good to keep you from being run over by bread trucks. There's a built-in microphone. You can take calls on your earbuds at just the press of a button. And you can hang up on people the same way, which is what I enjoy. Folks, Raycon started half the price of the other premium audio brands, but they sound just as good. They come with a 45-day happiness guarantee. And right now, drive through listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. 
15% off, not just one pair, everything you buy at buyraycon.com slash JC, 15% off. Stick these things in your orifices and you'll, you'll just, it'll be swell. You'll love it. And you don't have to lube these things either. They go right in. It's oh, already got the rubber the oil look. We get the so. point with the rubber oil look. Buy Raycon. That's what it says right here. Improved rubber oil look. 